I have type 1 diabetes. My body doesn't process glucose properly, which it needs to power muscle tissue and other pretty critical things, like my brain. What I don't have is insulin, a hormone secreted by the pancreas that helps cells take up glucose in the blood. That means for the past 15 years, I've had to give myself prescription insulin every single day. Without it, I'd die, and so would millions of other type 1 diabetics around the world. But luckily for me in the past decade, diabetes management has undergone a complete overhaul. Instead of pricking my finger every day, I now wear a glucose sensor to track my blood sugar. And rather than giving myself multiple daily injections, I can now just dial my insulin dosage into my pump. But one thing hasn't changed. I've been using basically the same insulin for 15 years. Unfortunately, the price has changed. In 2013, patients spent more than three times as much on insulin as they did in 2002. And the problem hasn't gone away since then. Now, there's a whole mess of finger pointing around who is to blame, but the key to solving the insulin crisis might be in understanding the protein insulin itself. What it is, how it's made today, and how it could be made in the future. The first effective treatment for diabetes leveraged the fact that any normally functioning pancreas produces insulin, and not just the human pancreas. So the earliest manufactured insulin was made by grabbing a cow or pig pancreas, grinding it up, and purifying the extracted insulin. Pretty crude, but it worked. Animal-based insulins weren't ideal because they could lead to allergic reactions, or theoretically even mad cow disease. That changed in 1978 when scientists figured out a way to create insulin in a lab, without the need for pigs or cows. That technology, known as recombinant DNA, took insulin to a whole new level. To make lab-grown insulin, scientists start with the human gene that encodes insulin production. Next, they insert the insulin gene into a plasmid, a small loop of DNA commonly found in bacteria and other microorganisms. Then they drop the plasmid into a living bacterium or yeast. The result is a microscopic insulin factory. The altered microbes multiply in a nice warm vat, producing insulin. Manufacturers can then harvest the insulin cells from the bacteria and purify it into the insulin we use today. So, with this technology, all a lab has to do is brew large volumes of insulin-producing microbes. And in return, they get a virtually unlimited supply of insulin, using very cost-effective ingredients. But if that's the case, why aren't more companies manufacturing insulin today? Hi, how are you? Hi, Mike, it's Corey. How are you, Corey? Good, how are you? So a patent is designed to promote innovation in the pharmaceutical industry. It typically takes a lot of research and development. It's very costly. I'm speaking with Michael Carrier, a professor of law at Rutgers University. And yes, we've got to talk about patents for just a minute. Basically, a patent grants an inventor exclusive rights to market and sell their product for a limited period of time. It gives inventors a head start to make money, but the system can get stretched. Insulin has been known about for at least a century. It was patented back in the 1920s. Nonetheless, companies keep getting patents on insulin. Sanofi has 74 patents on insulin. They last 37 years in total. Today, just three pharma companies, Sanofi, Eli Lilly, and Novo Nordisk, control nearly 96% of the world's insulin supply. For years, they've stacked patent on top of patent to extend their head start and prevent competitors from entering the market. Often, the new patents don't even change the therapeutic elements of the drug. They're just smaller tweaks to extend the patent's life. It's a tactic known as evergreening. With less competition, there's less pressure to keep prices low, which Michael says defeats the purpose of patents in the first place. It seems like this really isn't about innovation, but rather about making as much money as possible. Even so, some important insulin patents have started expiring, including those for Humalog, the insulin I've been using for 15 years. So you'd think that would open up the door for competitors. But there's a second roadblock. When you think of generic drugs, you might picture Advil versus ibuprofen. These are small molecule drugs that are relatively easy to produce in a lab. And it's easier to convince the FDA that they're carbon copies of the original. They have the same active ingredient, they're absorbed into the body at just about the same rate. But insulin is different. It's a compound called a biologic. Biologic drugs are more complicated. They involve living organisms. And with a biologic drug, it's harder to come up with an exact replica. That means it's nearly impossible for a competitor to create a generic insulin. Instead, the FDA has begun approving biosimilar drugs, compounds that are deemed to be close enough to the original that they have the same therapeutic value. But the process is more stringent. 
In the past decade, only 24 biosimilars have been approved by the FDA. In roughly that same span of time, thousands of generic drugs were approved. In short, the insulin market is paralyzed by patents and legal hurdles, so it's overwhelming for any newcomer to challenge the big players. But competing with big pharma on their own terms might not be the only way. Here in this discreet lab in Oakland, California, a group known as the Open Insulin Project is working on an entirely open source insulin, a version of the drug that would be free for anyone to copy and develop themselves. Zero patents. Their founder, Anthony DeFranco, started the project in 2015. I just looked at a, a technical reality and I saw that something was technically feasible and that there was a big need for it and decided to try to pursue it. And some people have joined me in that. The team is working on the early steps of insulin production, getting those microbes to take up the insulin genes. It's the same technology that those big manufacturers use, just on a much smaller scale. Scale up is possible. It's just a question of time, resource, and, and establishing the, the good process. At this stage, the work feels a bit random. It's hard enough getting the microbes to take up the altered plasmids, and that's without other variables like temperature and fermentation time. We're at the part right now where you just have to keep trying and see which ones are producing the best. So it's kind of like a almost artificial evolutionary process and we're relying on some amount of luck. But right now at the moment, it's just Jan and a couple other folks slinging the pipettes in the lab. So that takes some time. It's a pretty striking sight. A volunteer driven team in a cluttered lab trying to shake up a $22 billion annual market. Massive scale isn't in their near future, but that's kind of the point. Anthony says just leaders of viable culture could help thousands of diabetics. With enough DIY labs on board, the whole industry could become decentralized. What we're working on is, is setting up like a microbrewery model for insulin production, where you could have several small scale factories in every city instead of just a handful of factories that supply the entire world. This would mean a lot more direct involvement potentially from the people who are using the insulin in the business of making it. The idea of insulin microbreweries is exciting, but we shouldn't hold our breath. Anthony and his team haven't made any viable insulin yet. And even if they do, experts we talked to described a long road ahead. Bringing a biosimilar to market can cost as much as $250 million. And money aside, winning FDA approval means proving the safety of a complex and finicky compound. Here's one researcher's gut reaction to what Open Insulin is attempting. I mean, people can do it. You can do your DIY. But I got to tell you, this is not like making an omelet. This is really tough to do. And you make any mistakes and you can kill people. My opinion is stay away. Meanwhile, though, the problems surrounding insulin are only getting worse. Demand is expected to rise by more than 20% by 2030. That's at least 100 million more vials of insulin per year. Biosimilar insulin production is starting to ramp up in other countries, notably India. And here in the US, the FDA is planning to streamline the biosimilar approval process. But today, right now, half of all patients who need insulin worldwide don't have proper access to it. So the very fact that wild, out-of-the-box experiments like open insulin exist, it means things have gotten much worse than they ever should have. So today is National Diabetes Day, November 14th, and in downtown Manhattan, uh, just outside of the New York Stock Exchange, the group Insulin for All has gathered with the main message, patients over profits. 